As you know, we're doing a series this summer from the book of Ecclesiastes entitled The Search for Meaning. And this morning, uh, the title of the message is actually taken from an old secular song. Everybody needs somebody. For a penny, does anybody remember who used to sing that song? Everybody needs somebody sometime. I guess I'm the only old fogey in the room. But uh, remember that was, I think, Dean Martin's theme song for his show on TV back in those days. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, he writes, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can war one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. If you read in the verses prior to this, Solomon talks about what one person called the poverty of loneliness. And what he deals with is the man or woman without another. He's not talking about that if you're like if you're single that you have to get married or something like that, but he's talking about the sadness if there's no one in your life. If there aren't any people in your life. And the man without another is that. And as he goes on, he says he never does good for himself or for others. All he does is work and work and work. And there are some people that are so consumed by their work that they don't have time. They don't make time for people. And this is what we mean by the poverty of loneliness. Because Solomon says, this is one of the great vanities that exist. And the question that you want to ask this person is, who is he doing it for? If you're doing all this work, if you're doing all this stuff, and there's no one that you're sharing it with, either family or friend or helping someone out, then Solomon says that's just a great vanity. That's a great emptiness in life. One of the things that is going to come through in this particular message is that God has never designed anybody to go solo. That everybody does need somebody. Now, we come to the text that we have, and that is that two are better than one. And he gives us three examples here that we're going to look at this morning. The first thing is your labor is increased. How many times when you're working by yourself... Have you wished you had a third hand? It's sort of like when you're holding two things and you, 
in your hand with a tape maybe and you need to mark something there in the middle and you're just trying to figure out how in the world to do it and you can rig up different things but it's so much easier if you just have one person there to help you it's amazing that two people do not do twice as much work two people actually produce much more than that because they're able to work together and that accumulation is much more than two single people working by themselves now I know that some people are out there and they don't like to work well with other people but there are always situations in life where you're going to need someone and your labor is going to be much more productive if you have people to help you. The second thing that he says here is that you have help when you fall. Now one of the things that we notice is that children fall quite frequently and they bounce back up. What I've noticed is the older that you get, you don't want to fall because it gets harder and harder to help you back up. I remember one time when I thought that I would not be of much use, but I was in a senior in high school and I was riding on the back of a motorcycle with my next door neighbor, a good friend of mine, and we went off on a paved road onto a dirt road. Well, he didn't counter and factor in the extra weight or something like that, but before I know it, the bike was falling down, and it wasn't very fast, but it was falling fast enough to where it ended up where he was underneath the bike and I was straddling it. Now, it so happens that I had been injured and my arm was in a sling. So I really had only one arm to help. But you know, when that motorcycle was laying on him and the fact that I was able to reach down there and pick it up and lift it off him enough to where he could get out, that one arm helped a whole lot, even though I was far from what we would say peak condition. And you see, there are these times in our life, not only when we fall physically, but there are also going to be times in our life when we fall emotionally. There are going to be other times when we fall spiritually. And as Paul writes to Galatians, he says that when you see a brother or sister overtaken in a fall, you who are spiritual help restore such a one. What does that mean? That means literally lifting them back up. And you see, there is none of us that are such spiritual giants that we don't need people to help us. Again, we see that even in what's arguably the greatest Christian that ever lived, the Apostle Paul. How does God really begin his ministry? He begins his ministry. We know that he's saved on the road to Damascus and he has an experience with God. But as a result of that experience, he's left blind and so for three days, he's praying and fasting, and God sends someone to pray for him. Now, God could easily have healed him by himself, but God did not choose to do it that way because God was demonstrating something, and that is that I'm going to send you Ananias. And in fact, he had given Saul of Tarsus, who would become Paul, given him a vision, and he had seen this man coming to pray for him. And so it was the beginning of his ministry. Later on in the book of Corinthians, we can read how Paul went through, and we can't hardly imagine this, but Paul went through a very troubling time in his ministry where he became discouraged. He, he knew he needed help, and he knew who he needed. He knew that he needed Titus, because Titus happened to be, happened to have the gift of encouragement. Titus was one of those people that you just encountered him, and all of a sudden you felt 
lifted up. And so Paul went to a town thinking that Titus was going to be there, and Titus wasn't there. And what's amazing is Paul looked at the town and he said, there was a great opportunity here to minister. However, I left. He chose to go because he knew that even though there was an opportunity to minister there, it was somehow going to affect him negatively. He didn't have the energy. He didn't have the resources. He didn't have what it took to do the work that was being offered there. And he knew that he needed to get with Titus. All of us need a Titus in our life. We need someone that we know. I can call them. I can talk to them. I can go have a cup of coffee with them. And they're going to lift me up. Now, there are some other people that are reverse Tituses in this world. There are some people that will drag you down. Now, when you're feeling low, you really don't need to be around those folks. You need to just say, hey, I'm busy. God bless you. I'll talk with you later on. But you need to know those people in your life that help pick you up. That help lift you up. Because God will use them. Now you may be sitting there thinking, but hey, I just, I just want to pray and I just want God to do it to me without anybody. But you notice that God never works that way. Yeah, there are times when he tells people to go and do things individually. But most of the time, he joins them with their... How did Jesus send out the disciples? Not one by one, but two by two. Again, it's the same principle that we see this morning, and that is that everybody needs somebody. And what's amazing when you begin examining the disciples is that you find that a lot of times when God joins people together, whether husband and wife or uh, as a pair working together as the disciples were, that he doesn't put people who are the same. A lot of times he will actually put people who are very different from each other together. It's like Peter and John. We see them together all the time. Peter's this rough, brash guy always spouting off at the mouth, impetuous. We see that God uses him greatly, but Peter has this habit of always getting into trouble. And that's because he had what some people would call a very abrasive personality that just sort of turn people the wrong way. Now, John, on the other hand, what's the main title that we know John by? The disciple whom Jesus loved. The beloved disciple. You get this idea, this warm, loving sort of person. Why is he paired with Peter? Well, Peter's going on along through life, and when Peter gets through with him, they're bleeding, and John's there to help patch it together. And you see, we all need those kind of people. If you've got a, you know, if you sort of leave people the wrong way, if they're bleeding when you get through with them, and, you know, you may not notice it because a lot of these people don't notice it. They just say, I'm just being me, and it's like, that. well, you know, this person's bleeding over here. Why are they bleeding? Oh, well, they talked with you. You need someone, a partner with you to help patch it up. Oh, they didn't really mean that. They still love you. Don't worry about it. But you see, we have these personalities and we need these people to help lift us up. So we need those people in our lives, not just to lift us up physically, but to lift us up mentally and emotionally and spiritually to help pick us up. The third example that he gives in this is that survival 
becomes easier. He gives the example of someone comes by and, you know, they're too much for you to handle. It's easier for two of you to jump on them and to defeat them. And a lot of times in life, there are going to be situations, there's some things that you can handle and there are some things that you cannot handle by yourself. And you are going to need help of one kind or another. Survival becomes easier when you're in a community. I'll just give you an example, just a, a real quick example on leadership. One of the primary things that they teach you in leadership is that people want you or encourage you to have everybody own a particular idea or problem or project as far as the solution of it is concerned. Because here's what's happening if you go solo. If you go solo, it's true that if it turns out great, you will get all the credit. And so that's why we do that. <coughs> However, not everybody is perfect. And sometimes you're a number one idea turns out to be a flop. Anybody had an idea that turned out to be a flop? I have. Well, it's so much easier if you have talked it over with everybody that's involved with it, be it your spouse or be it your family or be it your partners at work or whoever it is, and you all agreed this was the good idea. Now, the good thing about agreeing on a good idea when it turns bad is that then when it turns bad, you're not the only one left with the blame. Then you can say, well, we all fell for that. We all thought it was good. I remember one of my professors at seminary used to say this, and I love to hear it. He said, there are some situations you need to just look at and declare victory and move on. whether it's a victory or not. But survival becomes easier when you're together. So what do we get from this? What does all of this mean? First is, all of us need help. We need help in various ways. I myself am colorblind. And back in the days when we wear ties all the time, I know Brother Dave's still holding on to that, waiting for the fashion to change. I could never, unless I was wearing a black suit and a white shirt, I could never just go in and pick out a tie. If I had the least bit of color, I would have to get Sheila to help me. And I remember one time, and so what I would try to do is, I would try to memorize the combinations. Okay, this tie with this shirt, with this suit, whatever. And I remember one time, I thought, well, I think I remembered wrong. I remembered, and I thought I had a pocket square that matched the tie and everything that was with it. And I was standing there in church and someone sent me a message, or Sheila sent me a message. And it was just simply this, lose the square. That's not even the most humorous time. There was one time when I had ordered uh, shoes and they were the same style of shoes, but I had it in black and brown. And my shoes got mixed up in the closet and not noticing it because they were both dark, I didn't realize I was wearing one a black shoe and one brown shoe. And I was trying, I tried to say, well, I'm just trying a new fad here. That didn't fly either. You see, all of us need help because while my weakness may be color blindness, all of us have blind spots.
How do I know that? How many of you can see out of the back of your head? None of you. God designed you. You have blind spots. So all of us need help. And the second thing is, relationships are important. No matter how great you think you are, relationships are important. If you've been watching the sports news in the last few weeks, the big news is that the guard on the Cleveland Cavaliers, who's a star, doesn't like playing with LeBron James, who many consider the best basketball player in the world. And so he said, I don't like this. Some people have looked at that and said, you don't like going to the finals every year. You don't like playing with the best player in basketball every year. You don't like this and you don't like that. And it's amazing because I've watched different people talk about it. And it's amazing the take of the millennials. And those of you who are millennials, please forgive me for not understanding you. But the take of millennials is, well, he just wants to feel good about his job. You see, I'm a baby boomer, and the sort of the mantra of my generation was, success always feels good. And succeeding is always a good thing, even if you have to put up with junk. And so it's easy to see the, the problems that we have. And so everything, and they're talking about tearing this team down, all because what? Relationships have not been maintained. Whoever the guilty party is, that'll be figured out sometime soon. But it's relationships are important. They're important if you have a sports team, even if you're paying someone millions of dollars. It's important in a home. It's important in a business. It's important in any area of life. If you want to succeed, learn how to have good relationships. Because you never know when you're going to need somebody's help. You never know when you're going to have to have help. And that brings us to the last thing, and that's just simply this, as I already said. God designed you to need someone. He intentionally designed your body where you need someone to look out for your back. He intentionally designed you to where you're always going to have to have help. And it doesn't matter if it's physically or emotionally or spiritually. All of us need help. You look at, again, one of the great examples that we see in Scripture is when Moses was called upon to lead the children of Israel and the children of Israel were going to war. And if you remember the story there, Moses was lifting up the rod of God. And as, as long as the rod was lifted up, the Israelites prevailed. But Moses grew tired. And so he would let the rod down. But as soon as he let the rod down, then the enemy started prevailing. And Joshua noticed this. And so Joshua got two men to assist Moses. And they had Moses sit on the rock. And they had one holding his right arm and one holding his left arm so that he, the rod would stay up until the children of Israel had victory. Again, it's just one of those stories where God is showing us none of you, no matter how great you are, can go it alone. 
because you're going to get tired, you're going to get weak, and you're going to let the rod drop. And it's normal, and you might as well expect it. But if you expect it, then you can have people, one on your right and one on your left, to help you when you get too tired, to help you when you've used all that you have, to help you gain the victory. See, that's the way God designed us. He didn't design you where you'll never get tired. He didn't design you where you would never get weak. He didn't design you where you'll be able to face every problem there is. All of us need help. And one of the first things that you can do in a moment of awakening is when you look in the mirror and you say, I need help. And then go and find the right people to help you. And that's why Solomon says here, two are better than one. Because when you're sharing, you're not only sharing the victory, you're sharing the pain, you're sharing everything, and you're coming to a point where, as he said, what is the search for Solomon? The search is for value. And he said, I found value. Value is not when you're by yourself. Value is when you're together with someone else. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you today for your grace and your mercy. I pray, God, that you would help us. I pray that you would help those right now, Father, who are looking at it and they're dealing. And maybe they're down and maybe they're feeling lonely. Help them to find the Titus in their life, that person that can lift them up, that person that can pull them up out of whatever pit they may find themselves in. God, I thank you that you've called us together as a community of believers that we're called upon to pray for one another, to help one another, to love one another, to forgive one another, to do all of those one another's. I thank you for that, Lord, today. And we just pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. The first question this morning is, Ecclesiastes written because of the wisdom God granted Solomon. Yes. At the beginning of his reign, God gave him a dream where he could ask for something. And God said, I will grant it to you. And Solomon asked for wisdom. And as a result of that, God gave him a special insight into humanity and human behavior and the world around him. You know, did he always use it? No, because he was fallible. That's just a sign that no matter how smart you are, you're never too smart to overcome your own mistakes. But he shared that wisdom with us in the book like Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. How do I let people in when I feel like I've been burned? Great question. There are several things that you've got to do. One is, you have to forgive the people that burned you. If you don't forgive them, you're never going to trust anybody else. The second thing is, you have to learn that when you're dealing with people, you have to take a certain amount of risk. Because when you open yourself up to someone, what you're doing is you're giving them the opportunity to hurt you. That's why the people that we love can hurt us far more than anybody else. And you say, well, how do I make good decisions then? And that comes into the third point, and that is pray for God to lead you to the right people. And those people are out there. 
and they exist. And find those people, and you'll... It's not that those people are perfect, but let's just say you won't be burned as much. What if nobody wants you? God does. That's right. I'll give you a piece of advice. If you want to have friends, be friendly. If you're friendly, you will find a friend. Now, there are some people in life, and they think their view through life is that they just want to take, 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 take. And if that's all you're doing is taking as much as you can get from people, after a while you will find friends are few and far between. That's why I say, and I think it's in one of the Proverbs, that if you want a friend, you must show yourself to be friendly. And that is, you find someone that you can help before you find someone that helps you. And it's amazing how that will work itself out. All right. How do I handle it if I am more like John and my wife is more like Peter? Well, the question sort of begs the answer, and that is, you sounds like you're a little bit like Peter yourself. Because John just loves people. And people around John will look and say, why do you hang around with a guy like Peter? And it's just sort of, well, it's just natural. That's what a lot of people have accused Sheila about me. They say, you're so nice. And I've just, I've had to live with that all of our marriage. Sheila's just, Sheila's just a nicer person than me. Everybody likes her better. It's my cross to bear. So I can sympathize. Thank you. Thank you. That's what they do. They love me, but they like her better still. <laughs> That's just the truth. Amen. Brother Dan.